Hi, folks. This is Wendell. Um, if you want to uh, find me online after we're done here, Facebook and Twitter is probably the best place to start to find me. And uh, for bio, for the context of this webinar, um, I happen to have written all the Cisco Press CERT guides related to these CERTs. Um, that aside, mainly I want to talk about the exams. And uh, so let's get into that. Brett had asked me to do a few level setting things up front. We'll just take a couple of three minutes on that. And then the rest of the time I'm going to talk about the technologies on the exams and some tips about how to approach studying for those so you'll be best prepared for it on exam day. So when Cisco announced changes to these exams back on March 26th, they kept the same exam structure, they just made new exams. So in this picture, you still got a two-exam path to CCNA at the top and a one-exam path to CCNA at the bottom. Now, a couple of changes in there, but the, the, the structure stays the same. The name changed from plain old CCNA to CCNA routing and switching. Um, the two-exam path gets you a CCNT when you pass the ICND-1 exam. The big news there, though, not depicted in the figure, is that Cisco also changed the minimum prereq for some popular other certs, namely CCNA Security, CCNA Wireless, and CCNA Voice, to CCENT. So you don't have to go all the way to CCNA routing and switching before you split off into those other technologies now. But otherwise, the structure stays the same. The other bit of background to keep in mind is that, as usual, Cisco is very generous with the transition options. You know, kudos to Cisco for doing that with every new exam that comes out. Um, with the two exam path, you have a bit of an overlap. Cisco gives us through September 30th to take and pass the old exams, and the new exams have been out since March. So um, here's the deal. You can take any combination of old and new to get your CCNA routing and switching. You pick them. Both new, both old, one old, one new, either combination. Um, some make more sense than others. Um, if you've not started uh, any study at all yet, go for the new. If you're almost done with your study with the old, go for the old. If you're kind of in between, that's kind of the tough place to pick. But uh, all those options are available. So let's talk about the exams and what's on them. Anytime we've ever been in a class from since we were kids, the teacher says, hey, there's a test Friday. What's the first question everybody wants to know, right? What's on the test? And the teacher answers, and the next question is, but what about blah, and what about blah, 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 et cetera? So we always want to know what's on the test, and whatever answer we get, we always want to know more. So let's start with the idea of what Cisco tells us is for sure, for real, on the test. There's a formal definition of exam topics that Cisco gives us for every exam. There are three exams we'll talk about today. There's the new CCNA 200-120 exam, and then there are the exams in the two-exam path, 100-101 and 200-101. If we were to look at the exam topics and look at every last word, it turns out that the CCNA exam is identical <coughs> to, as far as exam topics go, to ICND-1 plus ICND-2. That is, whether you go for the one-exam or two-exam path, you've got to know the same stuff. Right. So when you're picking your exam path, you don't have to worry about one or the other having more topics in them. They are equivalent when we look at what Cisco has told us about them. Now, if you think about the two exam path a little bit, so if you look at ICND-1 versus ICND-2, as drawn, they look like the same size orange boxes there on the bottom. That's on purpose. If you counted the number of exam topics, there's actually a lot more in ICND-1, but some of those are technically prerequisites for what's in the ICND-2 exam. So there, it's roughly a 50-50 breakdown of what's in the ICND-1 and ICND-2 exam topics. For our purposes today, I'm going to go through exam topics, and I'm going to, I've already picked ahead of time some to drill down on and give you some tips about. And I'm going to take it first with ICND-1, then with ICND-2, knowing that all of it applies to CCNA. So if you know if you're going for the one exam path, everything applies to you. All right, so that's where we're headed here. You can go ahead right now if you want to look while we're talking, open up a web browser, go to learningnetwork.cisco.com, navigate, as you see with the words there on the screen, go to the associate certs, look for the associate routing and switching, and then navigate till you find the exam topics link 
and you can see these. You'll see them during the presentation, but if you want to browse at your leisure, go for it. If you go look at the exam topics, remember here we're in class. We ask the teacher, what's on the test? Well, here's what Cisco's telling us formally, what's on the test. And this on the screen now is the literal first of seven sections of exam topics that you'd see at uh, Cisco's website. So operation of data um, of IP data networks, and I've highlighted one of those. This one exam topic may be one of the most overlooked but most important exam topics Cisco ever puts in, in the scope of CCNA. And here's why. This is the one most closely tied to how well you do on a job interview. So let's expand that a little bit. Let's just say you go to a technical interview for a job, and it's the network engineer at the place you want to go work, and they draw this simple diagram on the left with two PCs and three routers and some links. And they say to you, predict where data flows between those two hosts across this network. In other words, they just paraphrase the exam topic. You could spend an hour technical interview doing nothing but answering that, and the technical interviewer, interviewer saying, well, what if you had this feature turned on? What if you did NAT on router R2? What if you had an access list here? What if this line was actually a LAN switch and it did port security? Pretty much anything you ever see in the ICMD1 exam could be filtered through how you can do and how you can perform uh, this task. So one of the things you can keep in mind when you're preparing then is this. No matter what tool you're using to learn, if you're looking at a diagram, ask yourself, could I explain what I'm reading, what I'm watching in a video, um, what I've been doing in a lab? Could I explain that to my friend, my spouse, my mom, my kid um, with this simple diagram? Could, you know, pretend they're the interviewer. Maybe they don't know networking, but could I explain the basics to them? Can I articulate what's really going to happen? Why is PC1 going to, to router R1, for instance? You know, why does R1 choose to forward the packet to router R2? What do the headers look like in front of those IP packets? So that's the kind of thing Cisco's looking for in that kind of an exam topic. But the beauty of that one from a, uh, from a testing perspective is they can ask you something incredibly simple or the most complicated question in your exam, all based on what's happening in between there. So um, suggestion for prep, um, try to explain what happens in small networks like that to anybody that will listen while you're prepping. It's a, it's a good way to let yourself know whether you've got it down or not. So that's an example of one. So let's take a look second section, if we're again looking through the seven sections of the ICMD1 exam topics. The second part's on LAN switching. Uh, LAN switching is very fundamental. VLANs, there's a lot more of that in ICMD1. And part of that is VLAN trunking with the item that you see highlighted at the bottom. Now, in the case of VLAN trunking, say you've uh, just a quick definition for those of you that haven't learned about it yet. If you've got two switches like those you see in the diagram, that multicolored vertical line in the middle is physically a cable, but it has different colors to represent the different VLANs whose traffic goes across the cable. In this case, we show VLANs 17 and 19, and frames in those two different VLANs cross the cable, and they have an extra header that says this frame's in 17 or this frame's in 19. In 30 seconds or less, I just described VLAN trunking. And to be honest, to configure trunking right, I could give you another 30 seconds and you could have it down. 